Okay, welcome to today's Insight into Planning Your Curriculum session, part of the uh, Insight series here with the GIST Regional Support Centre. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce today uh, Deborah Gray, uh, Vice Principal, and Joe Fidget, Head of MIS at Chesterfield College, who are going to join us this afternoon to talk us through uh, how they've been planning their curriculum at Chesterfield College over the last few years, uh, which has had some uh, great results in terms of uh, learners and retention rates and also some efficiencies for the college itself. But that's as, uh, as much as I'm going to say, other than they've uh, recently been awarded the, the AOC Beacon Award, so uh, recognition from other sources. So without any further ado, I'm going to uh, turn off my camera and hand over to Deborah and Joe, who are going to take us on a uh, quick uh, insight into their planning of their curriculum. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to give you a quick wave so you know it's us, but we're actually quite shy. So we would prefer to do this with the camera off. Um, it helps with your streaming as well so that you get a clearer audio. For Joe and I, we, we prefer any questions to come through the chat facility because then we can pick them up as we're giving our delivery. If you do prefer to do it any other way, that's fine. Um, but we do pick up on the chat fairly quickly. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we would like to um, go through our curriculum planning with you. Um, I think there are lots of key things to cover, but as with any good teacher, we want to um, give you the aims and objectives of the session first. So this is us, that's me, I'm Deborah Gray and I'm the Assistant Principal for Curriculum. And that's my colleague Joe Fodgett, who's head of our MIS department. Hello. Um, so what's the, the purpose of the session? Why are we here today? Well, what we want to show you is how effective curriculum planning can raise your success rates and create efficiencies at the same time while improving learner voice and employer relationships. So no pressure there. Um, we've managed to do this over a two and a half year period with some quite innovative techniques and that's really what we're hoping to show you today. Now I'm going to make the assumption most of you will be curriculum or MIS specialists um, and we're going to tailor it for, for that particular audience. So if, if you're not a curriculum or MIS specialist, do flag it in the chat and then if you've got any questions, any acronyms you don't understand, just ask and we'll go through it with you. So what is it we're actually aiming to do? So as a result of attending the session, we hope that you will be equipped to review your curriculum holistically and ensure it's directly linked to local, regional and national LMI that each programme you offer makes a financial contribution and how to improve the accountability and responsibility of curriculum managers with regard to that financial contribution and also how cross-college working between curriculum teams, MIS and finance have led us to a more effective offer and a far better budget cycle. So, you know that we're from Chesterfield College. We are, by any measure, a medium GSE, uh, a medium general further education college. We're about 80% vocational, and we've got, on average, around 10,000 learners. And that's a mix of funding streams, HE, pre-16. The bulk of our work, around two-thirds of it, is still classroom-based. But we've got significant growth uh, in apprenticeships and employer responsive, which now makes up about 2,500 learners. So what circumstances were we in when we started to go through this process? Well, we had a rollover curriculum. Whatever you had the previous year, you just rolled it over and you hoped for the best. Um, it had been done that way for years. Um, so you can imagine it was, it was dated, it was not linked to labour market intelligence, it didn't do us any favours, is the truth. But that rollover position is very, very common in SE. It was an uninspiring curriculum because it hadn't had any innovation um, in it. It hadn't picked up on the new trends, new courses. It was uninspiring to me, to, to be honest, as assistant principal. So it must have been uninspiring to our learners. And actually our success rates reflected that. They were at benchmark at best. And I also felt it had a lack of scrutiny and viability. We were running courses, and, and not just one or two, um, at a loss, and some of them at a significant loss, because they'd never been scrutinised properly. 
And that includes things like running on small class sizes and a whole range of things. So we really felt it needed significant change. We had some internal drivers for this. Like most FE colleges and private training providers, we need to ensure our finances are sound. Um, we're under pressure, as is the whole of the public sector. I know you and your colleges will, will be under no illusions about this. But finance was a big driver for us. But we also have problems with our success rates. We were benchmark at best. We were kicking around the high 70s. It just wasn't good enough. Um, and we needed to innovate. We recognized we were a little bit of a dinosaur in this regard. And we didn't want that. We wanted to go effectively from dinosaur to dynamite. We also had a range of external drivers. And these won't be any different to the external drivers that you're facing in your own institution. The Wolf reforms were very important for us. Um, we wanted to make sure that our study programs were focused were linked to local uh, employers, served our learners well, um, and provided a whole range of additionality and non-qualification activity that, that really made our learners more employable. The funding methodology changes were also a massive concern for us, as it will be for any college. Um, the, under the new funding methodology, you know, you're looking at 540 to 600 hours. So we had to make sure we were covering that. We needed to make sure we had maths and English in there. Um, we needed to make sure our retention was absolutely top draw. And we needed to make sure, ultimately, our learners were employable. I, I view it as, as our job to get our learners a job. Um, we give them their sort of start with their employability. So it was really critical for us to make sure we covered all those external drivers as well. So we audited our provision. This was a top to bottom, line by line audit of many, many thousands of courses. Um, long, short, you name it. We went through it line by line. And we matched them to the funding bands um, to make sure that we were maximizing our funding where appropriate by hitting the minimum of 540 hours uh, and not exceeding 600, again, where it was appropriate to do so. And we actually found we weren't that bad after doing the audit. We had a small proportion of courses which were kicking around the 450, 400 mark. Uh, and actually, it wasn't a, a big job for us to correct those on our curriculum planning cycle. We also did a full viability review. It was RAG rated. We expect a 40% contribution to all of our programs. Um, we do make exceptions for lost leaders and for niche provision that no other provider offers. But generally speaking, if a course doesn't contribute 40%, then I'm not very happy about it. And it needs to be reviewed in terms of its delivery methods and so on. We also had a look at our growth and decline. Again, something that had not happened very well in the past. What sector areas were growing? What were declining? And had we matched our staffing and our course profile um, against those? We just had a question in from Dean, thanks Dean, um, which says, did we also align to the new rates for full-time adults? Yes, we did. Um, it wasn't as easy as I'm sure you're already aware, but it was part and parcel of the curriculum review. We also built in apprentices, HE, um, and all of the different funding streams. So I hope that answers your question. And we did identify, we did have growth and decline in some areas that we hadn't picked up on and we hadn't properly accommodated for. So what, what was our cycle and how did we draft up this process? We've been running this now for two full years, two full cycles. And the first year, I think Joe will agree, we were kind of flying blind. We, we didn't know if it would work. We hoped it would. We planned for it to work. We knew what we were doing was right. But we were working with managers from a very different culture, for whom challenge and accountability weren't necessarily there uh, in everyday working life. Um, so we started off with a full-scale curriculum planning day. Um, and I will go into each one of these in detail on subsequent slides. Um, by February, all of the CMs and the heads of faculty were expected to have a draft curriculum offer. And the interesting one for us is the March section, where we purchased the offer. This is a really interesting one. Um, and I certainly haven't seen many other colleges do this. Our curriculum managers and our heads of faculty come in 
to a, a, a combined management team of senior managers, MIS and finance, and they pitch their offer to us and we decide if we want to buy it or not. So in some respects, it's like a subcontractor arrangement for those of you who are familiar with subcontractor negotiations. Um, and it was a very, very different approach. Um, we then, in April, set up our curriculum um, on our particular MIS software, which is EBS, and the draft budgets are created. In May, the timetables are done, and by June, the offer's complete, ready to go, and we've got a set of finalised budgets in preparation for any other additional work we need to do over the summer. So on the launch day, what we do is we take all of our relevant academic and support managers, uh, and for me, primarily, that's my heads of faculty, my curriculum managers, plus managers from finance, MIS, and learner support, out off-site to a local hotel. We go into the ballroom there, not much dancing, I hear some to add, um, and it's an active and interactive day where they are given the guidance they need to create an effective curriculum. So they get a very clear steer on what it is I'm looking for. So the 40% contribution, the wolf compliance, the effective timetabling. But within that framework, they have a huge amount of freedom to innovate and deliver how they see fit. The, the then heads of faculty take out their teams on a secondary planning day. So this is bespoke to each faculty and normally has about five or six managers in, each of whom might work in allied areas. Um, so there's the possibility to organise cross-teaching um, and learners infilling in and out of programmes. Um, MIS and finance representatives go, and again, it's an off-site away day. So effectively, each curriculum manager will have been away for two full days. One with me to set the framework up and to start the planning, and one with their head of faculty to finalise and nail down the offer with MIS and finance expertise on tap. We also have to link all of our offer to LMI. It's a condition of approval. You, if you worked in a supermarket, you wouldn't put something on the shelves that doesn't sell, uh, and we're not in the business of, of putting an offer out there that is not needed or wanted. Um, we've had a question from Mark, how many faculties have we got? We've got 10. I have 10 direct reports. Um, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to try and remember them all now. Art, design and creative industries, academic and progression studies, business, construction and the built environment, care and foundation studies, hair, beauty, hospitality and catering, engineering, sport and public services, higher education and functional skills and ALS. I'm hoping that adds up to 10 mark and I hope it um, gives you some context for how many faculties we're dealing with. In total, it's around, oh, thank you Mark, it was well remembered on the hoof, uh, it, it adds up to around 90 managers, give or take. Well, I only remember it being in alphabetical order. That, that's actually the only way I remember it because that's how it appears on all my management charts, but well pointed out. Um, so, in terms of the LMI, we make it a condition that everything is linked to local, regional, national LMI. Tony, LMI is labour market intelligence and it's a trend position of all the jobs that are coming in or flowing out of a particular region or area. We match that LMI to new offers and retired offers. So as a result of looking at what jobs will be created over the next three to five years, we decide whether to retire some of our provision and whether we need to put brand new provision on in areas we haven't touched before. It also allows um, the creation of pathways and additionality, which means that effectively our curriculum becomes a bespoke tool for those learners. We don't have a curriculum where a group of 80 learners in four cohorts on a BTEC all do the same units. We genuinely provide complete personalisation of pathways and additionality. It takes some doing, but it pays off in terms of your success rates. Dean's asked which source we use for LMI, which website and database. It's a really good question, Dean. Um, I've got a, a marketing and research department, which I'm sure would know the answer to that, but I don't. What I will do is I will make sure um, we get the answer for you and to you, um, if that's all right. 
Um, so in terms of English and maths, we decided we needed really careful choice on this. We know that Wolf is emphasizing GCSE maths and English as the gold standard, but we're 80% vocational and we have predominant uh, learners at level one and level two. So we thought that actually insisting upon GCSEs was not the right approach for us. So functional skills would still be the qualification of choice for most vocational learners. Uh, and we recognize that actually deploying GCSEs in all circumstances could really compromise your success rates and it needs to be chosen carefully. So we've still increased our GCSE offer but functional skills will still make up the large proportion of our English and maths offer. And in terms of additionality, one of the interesting things that I've picked up certainly through colleagues in other colleges, because Wolf gives you the opportunity to do non-qualification based activity and cut your teaching and exam costs on formal additionality, some colleges have just cut it completely. Now, for us, our additionality has outstanding success rates. So the truth of the matter is, if we cut that, we might have compromised our overall success rates. And I don't think some planners have really considered the impact of additionality on their success rates. Um, so we made a strategic decision. We weren't just going to cut formal additionality qualifications willy-nilly. Only if they were no longer required would we remove them. They also have clear employment benefits to learners. Any Chesterfield College learner doesn't just leave with their main program. They leave with a suite um, of programs that they've achieved, and that's just how we like it. And the feedback from employers is that it makes them far more employable, and they stand head and shoulders of other candidates. So we wanted to preserve that under the Wolf reforms. And in terms of enrichment, so the non-qualification based um, activity, we wanted to make sure that whatever we did, it linked to employability and success rates, but it also linked to well-being and resilience. And we came up with some really off-the-wall ideas for this. So things like in our sixth form provision in particular, high stress rates around the time of exams, we put in meditation. We also put in juggling um, because of the mental agility and the discipline involved in practicing. So some of the things are quite off the wall, but they also have a direct link to our performance as a college and to the employability of those learners. They're not just done for fun, although fun might well be a really important benefit and side effect of it. So in terms of the purchase meeting where we choose to buy or not the curriculum that's presented to us by our managers, it's a full-scale formal panel meeting of MIS, Finance, SMT, and the head of faculty and curriculum managers of the area. So it's a very, very important and high-pressure meeting for those managers. They go through a line-by-line -line analysis of the proposed offer with us and make it very clear why they think that is the right offer. They are fully accountable to the targets that they put on each of those lines. And if we approve it, that's the target I expect to be delivered. And on the basis of that, we approve, we decline, or we ask for a resubmission because while we think the program might be right, something else might not be like the target numbers or the um, contribution rates. So it's a very, very rigorous. Dean's asked a, another good question. Um, how do we encourage, in inverted commas, 10 heads to provide a plan by February of March? And how do we deal with those that miss the deadline? That's a really interesting question. We're better at it this year than we were in the first year of the plan. But we do it by effective performance management, Dean. I set out very clear expectations with stage managed checks, and I expect delivery. Um, so for me, nobody overshot that. There were people who needed a day or two extra because a problem had cropped up. But quite frankly, if I say it needs to be done for deadline, my heads of faculty understand that it needs to be done by deadline. Um, and that's been a, an ongoing culture change over the last three years. We've had a, a question in from uh, another participant, which is, it, it sounds like a massive culture change, and how did we take everyone with us? Well, again, that's a really good question. Um, and it was a huge culture change, and not just for curriculum teams, but for everybody involved. The, the way we did it was by making sure they understood how important it was, how important it was to the college's future survival, to their survival, to the survival of their teams, 
Um, because if we didn't do this, you know, it, effectively we could have been in a deficit position, as could many colleges. I think, in fact, many colleges are facing that position. So we made a very compelling case for change. And then we followed it up with all of the information they needed to know that we were telling the truth. And we took them away out of their normal environment to give them training on exactly how to do this the right way. So when we get further on um, in the presentation, we see some quotes from some of my managers. And I think it's probably better you hear it straight from them than you do from me. So I hope that answers your question. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass over to Joe, who's going to take you through some of the technical side um, of the curriculum planning. So over to you, Joe. Hello, everybody. Um, right, so we have to think about uh, what systems we're going to use um, and behind that, what data we were actually going to need to capture to enable us to deliver what uh, management needed. Um, so we discussed with uh, internally, discussed with finance, and came up with uh, these sorts of sets of information, the qualifications that people are going to be delivering, uh, what particulars of delivery there were, so the hours that they were going to deliver it in, the dates, whether it was going to be crossover into subsequent funding years, um, the planned learner numbers, uh, also by then funding stream as well, what uh, the income was therefore going to be based upon the planned numbers and the qualifications, and, uh, and also any fees charged in terms of exam fees or, or tuition fees for, for 19 plus or HE learners. The, the, uh, also then the costs on top of that, staffing costs, uh, cost of delivery, uh, cost per learner, so the exam registration costs and such like, to enable us then uh, and get to a, a proper contribution statement per course and then be able to roll that up to provide a, a uh, information at curriculum area level, department level, and then uh, the college as a whole. So we have to decide how best to approach that. So as, as Deborah's already said, we started back in 12-13 with this, and that was the first year that we'd uh, gone for this fully, fully costed planning. Um, we didn't have much time to set up uh, something uh, to, 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 to purchase a tool. Um, in the end, we went for a very uh, uh, swiftly developed uh, spreadsheet, a very large spreadsheet, multiple columns, um, which seemed to grow by the week in those initial stages. Um, that enable people to plan course by course, line by line on the spreadsheet. Um, it linked into a LARA extract, so we had the, the LARA, the, um, the Learning Aims Reference uh, application, um, as it was, or was it lab then, I can't remember, it changes so often. Um, that was um, linked in uh, from a, 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 a downloaded extract, uh, so that we could uh, draw through the proper qualification information. Um, and through the process of capturing the information, we were able to then determine those costs, um, the incomes, and therefore the contribution rates. And once we'd gone through the whole purchase uh, side of things, once we'd agreed what curriculum was going to be delivered, we were then able to take that spreadsheet extract and feed it back into our, uh, our EBS, uh, our, our main uh, student record system. Uh, yeah, uh, somebody's asked a question about uh, the formulas for funding methodologies. Yes. Uh, for planning for 12-13, it was a little bit easier uh, because obviously we're at uh, most things are at qualification level. So yes, we did add in uh, our own uh, formulas with our own program weightings and, uh, and everything else uh, in there. Uh, we worked it out on two different rates. We worked it out on the rate that would come out of our sort of against contract overall, and also what it would be weighted per program per individual qualification. Uh, moving on. That, that, and that obviously that whole process was very labour intensive in terms of the, uh, the, the feeding stuff back into our main MIS system. So with the changes uh, ensuing for 13-14, we really very quickly realised we couldn't continue with the spreadsheet solution. Uh, the wolf changes, the, uh, however, whatever people say about simplification, the diverging and complex funding methodologies that were coming, um, there would be uh, and, and also, at the time, the undefined funding rules that were around, or not around, we was, there, was, there was no way we were going to be able to develop something in-house. The, 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 the cost of development and the, need, the, the time needed to, to support it through the year would be too much. So the risk was too great, so we thought we'd better seek a third-party uh, solution. And there wasn't very much out there. Um, there, there is a, 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 a curriculum planning tool uh, linked to EBS, our, our, our student record system. But when we looked at that initially, it wasn't 
for us a bit for our purpose. It didn't quite do all the stuff that we'd been doing in our own spreadsheet. So we, we discounted that, looked elsewhere, and came across uh, Drake Lane Associates, who do supply several systems to, to uh, FE. Uh, and they had a, a product called Forecast, which had been going a few years, and they were in the process of rewriting it for 1314. So it was a um, it was a, a very refreshing demo that we got from Forecast uh, from from Drake Lane. Uh, they were very clear on what it could do and what it couldn't do. Didn't promise the Earth uh, to get a sale, and were very clear on what uh, the, the impact of the 1314 changes on on their development of the system. Um, what was uh, it, or it also is a, is a SQL Server client-based application, so uh, fitted in well with uh, other things that we were doing. It replicated our spreadsheets we'd done in 12.13 very well. We, you know, it was very heartening to see that all the things that we'd looked to capture ourselves were also being captured by this system. Uh, so it meant we'd got it right the previous year, uh, however difficult it had been. Um, in terms of the support from Drake Lane, been excellent throughout the whole process. Uh, the response to any issues that, that crop up, and inevitably, it's a developing system, issues have cropped up, but uh, uh, fixes and uh, updates have been uh, forthcoming whenever we need them. And also be very open to suggestions for, uh, for tweaks and developments uh, going forward. Uh, so that's, that's forecast. Uh, the, uh, in terms of behind the scenes, like the, it's very much a permission-based access. We're able to set it that curriculum managers can just see their area of curriculum. Heads can see all of their curriculum areas. And then MIS, Finance, and Deborah can see everything uh, and see the, 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 the impact of everything that's going on as, the, as people plan their curriculum. Um, just to get the, the ball rolling, we basically we, we did the dreaded roll forward. Uh, we actually did roll forward our 12-13 curriculum into 13-14 into, in our EBS system to uh, allow us to import that into forecast as a starter for 10, really. Um, it meant then that um, areas could uh, remove provision that uh, immediately flag stuff that needs to be deleted that was not going to go forward into 1314, make amendments to current courses that were going to continue, uh, and um, also uh, enable them to add in new new provision. And I had a question from uh, from Dean again. Do we have many generic Z quals? We we don't actually know. Um, very very few, in fact. Uh, we've never seemed to have uh, embraced uh, the uh, the Annex H for those that know uh, the stuff that's in the Annex H. We we do have we do have a few which we we um, have manually uh, tweaked when we've needed to. But no, it's not been a, it's not been a big problem for us really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good for us, very much so. Um, so where was I? Uh, yeah. So within the forecast system, there've been uh, curriculum, managers, curriculum managers have been able to plan uh, programs within there for both the Wolf program agenda and also at an individual aim level for adults, all within the same uh, place. They've not, we've not had to uh, have any setting up courses twice or planning courses in two different ways. It's all been able to be done in one place. Which is very, uh, very, uh, much, you know, very user friendly. Um, it again also has a live link to Lara. Uh, in, it's not a live link to the Lara uh, website, but it is a, a, a Lara extract downloaded and has everything in there that it needs. And since the decision not to update Lara properly for 1314, an, an example of uh, Drake Lane responding to the need, they've now linked into the uh, uh, SFAs. Uh, notorious qualification spreadsheet uh, to, to provide the right funding information. Um, what was also good for us was that the managers understood the process already. So them getting a new system wasn't actually as big a barrier as it may it may have been if this was the first time they were starting out. Forecast could have been a bit of a uh, you know a, a, a large hurdle to get over, but because they've gone through the whole process of planning and learning the numbers and thinking about their incomes and their costs. They, uh, they were able to embrace it quite uh, quite readily. Uh, moving on. Um, within the system, it's very flexible. You can add columns in, remove columns of data, um, and um, also then select and save multiple different screen layouts for different uh, for different people who want to review that data, finance or MIS and heads of department. Uh, another question about uh, 
do the quickly managers input direct directly in? Yes, they do. Um, they they have their own uh, read at the time. They have their own read and write access to the system. They could make the changes for their for their own provision. Um, since then, since the purchase, since we've actually locked down the system, they cannot now make any changes without somebody else making it with them. Uh, I through through MIS, we make the changes with them once it's been agreed and approved that that change can uh, can happen. Um, I'll come to that question uh, in a, in, a, in a second um, uh, about the uh, importing back into EBS. The within the system there is uh, summary information always visible at the top of the screen, which we'll show in a few minutes in some uh, some slides that I've, I've got uh, up. Um, you, it will always reflect whatever um, provision you've got filtered at that time. If you're just looking at a curriculum area, you will see there. Uh, their, their curriculum area income costs, learn the numbers planned in. Um, and it also has uh, dashboard views within it. You can see a summary information uh, very uh, very quickly and get a, a feel for how a curriculum area is or, or, the, or the college as a whole is, is shaping up. Uh, it's also got inbuilt validation rules which help to identify issues in the data uh, where an expired aim has been used, or where maybe one, more than one core aim has been planned into uh, into a program, uh, it's been a very useful uh, tool to, to help us ensure we're getting a decent set of uh, course information. Um, in terms of exporting, uh, a question a few seconds ago, um, importing into EBS, if there isn't a direct link to EBS. We set up our own course code within. Uh, the, the forecast software, which is basically we, we, we it is a bit a bit a bit cumbersome at the point at this point. We basically go and set up a uh, a, a blank course code in EBS. Go and set set up a, a blank uh, wrapper for us to import the course into all the course information uh, into once we uh, take an extract from from forecast. That process has already been done. Uh, basically, so a, a, an output onto a, a, a into a database and then import it back into EBS. Um, it can export um, into spreadsheet, XML or PDF, the various screen views. Um, somebody's asked a question about the cost. We paid for a site wide license uh, about 13, 13 and a half thousand pounds. Um, I think um, 9,000 of that I think was for the core product and the rest was for the user licenses. Uh, there is on bands based upon the number of learners I think you've got in your in your college. Um, uh, in terms of the final question, tribal, uh, there is there isn't a direct, uh, as I've mentioned, a direct uh, import function um, at this point. But we know tribal are uh, in the past certainly for us have been uh, tricky in terms of direct importing anything into the system. Uh, but hopefully that can be uh, overcome in, in 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 future years. Uh, in terms of how do we do it, well, as, as I was saying, we basically create a blank course code for anything new. Uh, it only, only matters for anything new, but we create a blank course and import uh, from an extract from forecast. Uh, anything that's current, we just overwrite the EBS data with uh, whatever has been amended in the forecast uh, extract. Um, moving on. Some, some uh, screen dumps of the system. This is just, uh, you know, Rough data. It's not uh, not necessarily live data. Um, so just a, a, an idea of what uh, what you can see. This is a, the what is called the program tab. So at the top of the screen or in the, the middle of the screen, you've got the different programs uh, set up. Um, towards the bottom of the screen, you've got the content underneath those programs. So for that one that's highlighted a, a vehicle repairing uh, a paint qualification course program, at the bottom you've got all the different component parts of that study program. Um, with also then the, the various headline uh, course particulars, uh, the dates and how many hours and weeks and uh, planned hours in total. So that program view gives you an idea of by program the total income costs contribution. Again, these are all completely configurable columns. You can add in whatever you want. You want to show more about the learner numbers you planned in and the different funding stream of learner numbers you planned in. You can add those columns in. At the very top of the screen, there is a very uh, a headline uh, position of the costs, uh, income, contribution, learner numbers, uh, with little drop-down functions in there to enable you to um, see for a curriculum area what's going on at that point in time. But 
I would say what you're seeing there isn't, isn't live uh, correct information, so uh, things don't necessarily add up. Um, so a useful uh, overview um, a, a overview screen. Um, just moving on to the next one. Um, this is a uh, now an individual uh, course level, individual qualification, component part of programs uh, level. Uh, it's a bit of a cannibal ice cream, this, so it doesn't quite look like this on when you are looking at it. Um, to the left, uh, you have uh, the income uh, component parts. Uh, how many plan numbers, learner numbers do you expect, target numbers, what that might then translate to in terms of tuition fees uh, and, uh, and the SFA or EFA funding. Um, the also then other the other funding streams, target numbers, uh, and anything else you want to add. Somebody chucked a question a second ago about does it uh, uh, build in the retention factor? Yes, it does. You can set it at, at, at all, various settings. You can set at global level for the college as a whole, so it applies to everything. Or you can set it at individual qualification course level. Uh, so locally for each qualification, we do set it at um, at qualification level, and we based our retention factor on whatever their retention was last year. So we, we, you put in that retention and that achievement rate and it will use that to, as a to factor in uh, retention funding for EFA and, and the achievement funding uh, for the SFA. Um, but as I say, uh, equally uh, you can also set it so that it, it will override everything and set it against whatever you've had provided to you on your EFA statements, uh, your, your contracts. You can, you can apply those, those values if you want to get uh, uh, and effectively an, an ILR output view of the data. Uh, another question, uh, can managers pass any of the, the purchase process to the rest of their team to develop the programs? Uh, yes, they do. They should be doing that. That is part of the process. They should be looking at uh, in, in conjunction with their teams. Um, I don't know whether you want to just chip in on that. Absolutely. Thanks for the question. It's a really, really good one. Um, they do share this with teams. It was more problematic in the first year because it was a culture change for managers. This year it's a culture change for staff. So as we move through this process, staff are beginning to realise we've got to be much more business focused, we've got to be slicker, we've got to be cleaner. And all of that is cascading down to the teams as well as the managers. For me, leadership and management is not just a function of managers, it's a function of every single person in the organisation. Um, and I want everybody competent and able to deal with issues like this, perhaps at different levels with different levels of responsibility. But I want um, autonomy and innovation in the teams. And this was a really good tool to get some of that. Right, so we're moving on then to that to the, to the right hand side. Then you can see the costs. So I've just uh, copied this uh, a screen dump onto this this slide. Uh, you can set these costs. It, uh, people often say when they're trying to sell you a product, oh, it's fully configurable. You can do everything. This really is fully configurable. You can set up whatever you want. You can set costs up at uh, enrollment level for learners, or uh, hourly based in terms of lecturer costs, or cost for the uh, delivery of the course as a whole. Um, so. You, you, you are fully, it's fully flexible and you can really add in and, and take away whatever you want. Uh, so that, uh, at, at individual course level, gave curriculum managers the, the, the ability to determine uh, the impact of their decisions, uh, how many hours they planned in, how many hours they may be uh, allocated to lecture hours, or if uh, any vocational specialists, as, as we refer to them as, uh, were to do any teaching hours. So they could, they could vary, uh, vary different things in here and play, play around and see what the impact would be of, of if they did things in a different way. Um, da -da -da. Moving on to the, uh, the final slide for, for the data side of things. Uh, an example dashboard view. Uh, this is an out of the box view uh, for this particular curriculum area that's filtered for. Shows you um, funding and enrollments and learners and uh, the costs, uh, incomes and, and a headline contribution on the, on the dial there. Um, a, uh, another question, da, 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 a few questions, let me just catch up with where we are. Um, Mark's asked, uh, you mentioned at what, uh, at what point is it locked down? We basically locked it down once the purchase had, had, had been approved and, and co course had been approved or declined. That was when the point we, we changed the status of those courses in forecast and either set it to be approved or declined. Uh, and at that point, curriculum managers could no longer edit. Uh, and only MIS or finance could edit. Uh, so nothing could be done without uh, approval and things snuck in by the back door that weren't necessarily planned in. Um, another question about uh, uh, would it handle non-qualification courses? 
Yes, yes, we plan our full cost in here as well. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to have a qualification attached to it for it to for it to work. Uh, it's all about really what you what you want to put in in terms of uh, your you, you set your own uh, costs, you set your own income, and it will calculate uh, off that basis. So yes, we use it for full cost uh, as well as our pre-16, uh, where we're working off uh, uh, other other sort of funding methodologies. So it's it is fully fully flexible. I hope that answers the question. Um, so as a system. Really, really good. It's really heartening to see a, a system that is really truly being developed for the end user. Um, good for the, the, the curriculum manager to, to do their planning. The, the tricky bit has has been the getting the data back into the uh, the core uh, management information system. Um, that will be something we need to work with Drake Lane on for next year, but probably also with Tribal. Uh, whether other software providers are more flexible, um, I'm not sure. So uh, yes, that's the that's the hurdle we have at the moment. So I'm going to pass you over back to Deborah now. Thanks, Joe. So, what were the key things that helped this work? Well, I think the key thing was we did this in partnership. This was a multifaceted approach. Traditionally, in our college in particular, um, the curriculum teams had effectively led the show. MIS and finance as supporting players. That wasn't how it was in our new process. It was a genuine partnership of all three areas of the college. Um, and we found that that partnership has been incredibly beneficial for everybody. We certainly didn't want our MIS and finance colleagues chasing around after us with a poorly designed curriculum trying to correct our errors. Um, and the truth of the matter is that's effectively what they've done for some years. We wanted to make sure curriculum teams were on the money, were playing a very smart curriculum, um, which would generate high levels of success. And in order to do that properly, we needed our MIS and finance colleagues. We couldn't do it alone. So it was a very, very different approach from curriculum calling all the shots to being a genuine partnership. This is a quote from our curriculum manager in catering and hospitality. So forecast allows me to see how our programs fit together. Going away for planning is brilliant. And then when we sit down with SMT, it feels good when we get their stamp of approval when they purchase our offer. Um, you know, Paul's a, a curriculum manager. Um, and traditionally, curriculum managers haven't always engaged well. Um, but Paul's not unusual now in his comments at all. Um, the new process means we are not just doing the same curriculum planning every year, it's under continual review and we can see on a direct comparison basis um, where we are. That's Trevor, he's uh, one of my direct reports as Head of Advanced Technologies. Um, and traditionally in engineering and construction in particular, there has sometimes been less engagement in this kind of process. I don't want to stereotype there because that would be <laughs> completely wrong. Um, but we don't have those problems now. This is a quote from Nick, who's our curriculum manager in carpentry and joinery. It's quite a long one, but I think it's really, really interesting um, because of the change of temperament it shows. Um, we had a new and what appeared to be complicated process dropped on us at short notice to help make curriculum planning more effective. As you can probably gather from my opening statement, I was not looking forward to this process. And I think that was fairly typical uh, of the position we're in two years ago. My initial sceptical opinion was soon quashed as I began to explore the document and found out how powerful it was. All of the curriculum in one place with all of the associated information, dates, numbers, qualification names, funding, materials, cost, um, and a wealth of information to enable him to manage his courses well, including their financial performance. And I think because Nick was quite typical of and some of our CMs who didn't understand what we were doing, didn't know why we needed to do it, weren't particularly business focused at that time. You can see the culture change process we've been through on that. So what's been the result of all this and where has it led us? Well, we had our curriculum offer in place uh, by Easter in both years, which is six to eight weeks earlier than normal. And when I say normal, I mean kind of normal in a loose sense because sometimes it would trace all the way on through to September. Um, and I'm sure some of you are in a similar position. But it was clean and finished uh, with a crisp end by Easter. Um, and while the full impact of the Wolf study programs isn't yet to be realised um, because they don't launch until September, we're happy that the offer is robust, it's exceptionally well planned, and it made the best use of cross-college expertise in MIS finance and business development. 
So in terms of the actual quantifiable results, well, we were able to make a net saving of 2.2 million in 12-13, and we've got projected savings of an additional 1.7 in 13-14, and we've had three-year increased success rates. So we've managed to save money and increase our success rates for the last two years running. Um, it's not difficult. It is not rocket science. It can be done with effective planning and effective partnerships. Because if you pick up on all of the over teaching you're doing where you don't need to do it, you pick up on all of the learners who aren't meeting the next funding barrier, you pick up on all the courses that actually aren't making the contribution you need to run an effective college, and it soon adds up. When you strip out some of that underperformance, what you actually do is you enable curriculum managers to be far more accountable for their provision. And by doing that, they take ownership of it and you get increased success rates. So what are our next steps? Where are we going um, you know, for, for our next um, road? Well, we need to consolidate further. This is only our second year. We've still got um, things we need to improve, points we need to clarify, uh, and issues we need to improve on. We do need to make sure we've got ongoing training for the curriculum managers and the heads of faculty. And that includes things like labour market intelligence, business development, and financial awareness. For me, these are absolutely key things I need my managers to be aware of. It's not just a senior management function. It's a leadership and management function across the organisation. And we've got increasingly sophisticated labour market intelligence which feeds our curriculum plan. So we know exactly what trends are going to arise over the next five years and we can plan accordingly for them. Um, but I do think one of the, the biggest successes has been the partnership working between MIS Finance and Curriculum. Um, and I would hope to build upon that. So that's our presentation in a nutshell. I really hope um, you've enjoyed listening to us today. We're more than happy to take any additional questions you've got now, or equally, um, I'm sure Kevin would be happy to provide mine or Joe's contact details if you prefer to speak with us in more detail about anything that we've gone through today. Um, and it's been a genuine pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Deborah Joe. I'm sure everyone uh, listening in found that a very uh, compelling story from the from Chesterfield College. You know, uh, you know, technology has been part of that, but I think the most important part has been the culture change uh, within the college over the last uh, uh, couple of years. Um, I've just got time for perhaps one more question uh, now, and then, like uh, you mentioned, look, if anyone's got any subsequent questions, we can take them and pass them on at a later point. We've had lots of questions so far, so we have overrun by a couple of minutes, but hopefully that's been a sign of uh, the uh, uh, enthusiasm people have had within that. Um, Deborah or Joe, would you like to um, come back on Gordon's question about do you have any systems like data dashboards to track through the year on year on retention predicted achievement? Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly respond to that. Thanks for the question, Gordon, because it's a good one. Until recently, we didn't. We do have one now, and I'll pass on to Joe for an explanation of that. But how we tracked um, achievement and retention prior to that fact is. I hold very, very robust one-to-ones every 10 days with each of my um, faculty heads, at which point I do a top-to-bottom data review, um, identify any trends, pick up on any early withdrawals. Um, I absolutely expect them to know their data inside and out, because I do. Um, and it's a, it's a woeful day if I know their data better than they do. So we have absolute robust attention to year-on-year -year, um, trends to, um, that, that's actually any data, because we, we don't just do retention achievement, we'll do applications, we'll do value added, we'll do predictive grades. So it's a, it's a fair old grilling for my poor heads of faculty, but they're two years into it now, so they know exactly what to expect. Um, they understand they are in the hot seat, it is their curriculum, and actually, if those trends are in decline, it is their responsibility with me to turn it around. So we have very focused performance management of our curriculum teams. But in terms of the technology we've recently bought, I'll hand over to Joe for that. Uh, yes, we have got a dashboard uh, system. We've uh, purchased the uh, Dynastics uh, Active Dashboards. Um, this is the first year of, of it. Uh, it's We've, we've had a first release. It's still a, uh, uh, an emerging uh, bit of technology for us. Uh, we do uh, certainly track uh, 
headline sort of funding, attendance, retention on it at the moment, but we will be expanding that to, to, to further things uh, in the future once we get to the end of the year with achie achievement and success coming through. Uh, inevitably, that will be in there too. Uh, so that does provide uh, Griffith managers, heads, and uh, SMT with uh, uh, up to date information, uh, hopefully, to think their fingertips. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Joe. Um, okay, uh, just uh, to round up today's session, just like to flag up um, a couple more of the uh, webinars that are coming up over the next couple of days. So this, uh, this is the end of the first day now. We've got seven more webinars still to come over tomorrow and Friday. So, and you can book for that uh, via the RSC website. And then next week, uh, the second part of this week's the online week. And then next week, we've got two face-to-face -face, uh, sessions, which uh, are in Leicester and Nottingham next week. And they'll be looking, one of the workshops in there is looking at the study programs that were mentioned today, uh, as well as uh, picking up on lots of the other uh, activities this week. Uh, thanks, Gordon, for putting that in the chat panel. So you can click through to that. Um, so all the resources both today's from today's session and all other ones will be uh, making their way onto our Moodle platform, uh, and it's the uh, web address is on there. And so we'll be working hard over the next few days to turn those around as quickly as possible to get them up on the site. Finally, uh, just. Uh, a quick reminder about the who we are. If you need any support in some of the things that um, Joe and Deborah have been discussing through today, uh, we're here to help. Uh, so that's it for today's session. Um, if you need any, if you want to get in touch with us, if you've got any more questions for Deborah or Joe, then please uh, get in touch with us. And uh, thank you very much once again, Deborah and Joe, for a very compelling story from uh, Chesterfield College. Um,